So thank you everybody for joining us today. I think this is gonna be a really fabulous demonstration with Jacob Fry. Um, so like I said, um, good morning everybody and thank you for spending your, um, your Wednesday morning with us and for today's pottery demonstration with Jacob Fry. So for those of you who are familiar with Mayak and our programming know that pre-pandemic, we regularly hosted monthly pottery demonstrations in our Buxbaum gallery. But now that we are past the one year mark since our last in-person program, we are continuing our pottery demonstra um, demonstration series on Zoom. And we kicked off this virtual series in February with Karen Abeda, and then again in March with Randy Chido. And we're continuing this April with Jacob Fry. And so if you're interested in tuning into future demonstrations, please um, check out our Facebook page and our monthly newsletter for upcoming announcements. So before we start chatting with Jacob, um, a few things. First of all, I'd like to briefly acknowledge where I am and the place where Mayak is located, even though we are not physically at the museum today in Ogopoge within the Tewo. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewo people. And I wish to acknowledge all of the native people, past, present, and future who walk on these lands. So during the course of this presentation, if you have any questions for Jacob, please type them into the chat box. Um, I will be moderating questions um, at the end of the program for the most part. So please don't send your questions more than once. I promise you that I do see them and I will try my best to get to them. Um, I will be turning off my camera so you can all focus on Jacob. And I'd also suggest that everybody make sure that you're on speaker view rather than gallery view. So I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce Jacob and then I'll hand it over to him. So Jacob Thomas Fry was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico and is an enrolled member of Tezuki Pueblo. He is a fourth generation potter and painter. Fry comes from a diverse ethnic background that is true New Mexican. His mother is a traditional potter from Tezuki and his father is an artist from Fort Collins, Colorado. His passion for art and learning started when he was five years old, working um, alongside his parents with clay and among other art forms. During his childhood education, he received first place in pottery at the Old School Gallery at the El Moro Area Arts Council. And in the fall of 2019, he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from IAIA. He is inspired by great Renaissance Pueblo artists like Nampeo, who gave life to Sidiaki Polychrome. In addition, his influences include Maria Martinez, who reestablished the Black on Black tradition, and his great grandfather, Thomas V. Hill, produced watercolor paintings in the 1900s. So this is going to be a really fabulous um, presentation. And from here, I will hand it over to Jacob. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again. OK, I guess you guys can all hear me. But anyways, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. For, uh, having me. Um, this is my studio here at home. Um, I'm so thankful to be a part of the virtual pottery series that Mike is doing. Um, I would like to thank Angela, Lillian, and Rob for putting this together and everybody at Mayak. Um, today I'll be going over a pottery building demonstration, um, but I would like to first talk about the tools that I use um, just in the pottery general building sequence. So the clays that I use are all hand dug clay. I use three different types of clay. Um, this one is a Zuni. The Kaolin style clay. I use a, um, a siltstone style clay that I call the Rima clay. And I use another clay that is more of a slip yellow style clay. Um, I use volcanic ash in the mixture. Um, and I use uh, wild spinach and hematite for my paints. Those are just some of the tools that I use to get going. Uh, the tools that I build with is a paddle, a wheel, just to rest my cookies on, a rolling pin, and a few scrapers. So I use a rubber um, two inch scraper and a metal uh, three inch scraper. So those are pretty much all the tools I use and water to create my potter. Um, so the, I have three different techniques of building pottery. Um, I have a pookie press mold uh, style that I'll be demonstrating and another press mold upside down um, uh, press mold with a foot style that I'll be demonstrating also. I won't be demonstrating the hand-built um, 
a small coil technique. This is uh, what I decided to choose to do. So uh, I'm going to get started. If you have any questions, let Lilia know. And I'm going to be dipping in and out of the camera because I have to grab stuff. So this is my first tool. It's a plaster of Paris cookie. Um, it's kind of like a mold, a big cookie, I call it. So <clears throat> all my clay has been already pre-wedged about 200 times. Um, wedging is very important. It is to um, wedge the clay together and to create, there's less air bubbles when you do that. It makes the clay all together as one. So you're not having to deal with um, the, the, the discrepancies of the clay as you're working. So this clay has already been pre-wedged. So I'm gonna start off with the, the Pookie Pac-Man style, I call it. So I'll start. <clears throat> Swishing my clay down into like a hamburger. I call it a big hamburger. You just want to kind of get it rounded. Like so. Kind of like you're making a tortilla. Clay tortilla. That was a big air bubble right there. So I guess I didn't wedge the clay so well. We're going to go along with it, but it might get me in the long run. <clears throat> but with the press mold cookie style, you're really able to press the clay out. So all I'm doing right now is just rolling the clay into a circle to about quarter inch to an eighth inch thick. thick. You don't want to get it too thin. It's actually better to work thick than thin. You can always subtract. It's really kind of hard to add with clay, um, but you can always add. I'm a contradictor. I'm always contradicting myself. So yes, yeah, so with the rolling pin, you're able to see the, the air pockets as they're created. And for example, I have quite a few air bubbles in this clay. This is a new clay that I just discovered. I call it the, the yellow Pescado clay. So this is actually a, about the third time using it. I've made it <clears throat> over the winter time, uh, drying by the fireplace, so. Um, Jacob, we have a question that just come in about um, Pookie. Just yeah. Asking for you to kind of explain what that is and I think maybe spell it so people can hear you. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so a pookie is just either, um, so this is a plaster Paris pookie. I made it myself. So um, it's basically plaster Paris. Um, and then I go to like Walmart or any sports sh uh, store and I try to find the most perfect round ball. And when the plaster of Paris is still wet, I set the ball inside the pookie to create a sphere-like um, a mold press. Um, it's not really a traditional uh, style of this. Usually a pookie will consist of a, an old pot or it's just to hold the base of the pottery in itself um, to keep its shape, uh, literally. Um, a puki is a Taiwan uh, word. I think it's spelled like P U K I, puki, puki. Um, but uh, yeah. Great, thank you. So, yeah. I like to use pukis, it's just another tool. Um, and it just helps to get the process going. And I usually use a five gallon bucket lid because. Pottery is all about just building circles and constantly um, keeping the shape. And I'm not that pro yet where I can just make a perfect circle. Maybe one of these days I will. But so I'll just trace a five gallon bucket lid because I know it's gonna fit inside that pookie. 
and I'll re remove the excess clay. And I find the very center of the circle. And I'll cut a line down, kind of like you're cutting a piece of pie or a pizza, or, or like that one auntie that's like, I want that big pizza pizza or something. But anyways, so I call it the Pac-Man. So what I'll do is I'll save the piece of pie that I cut now, like so, and I'll set that aside. And um, the first step I'll do after I do the Pac-Man, I'll kind of show you guys how it looks. So see, Pac-Man. Um, and I'll set that back down and I'll slip and score one side of the Pac-Man biting lip. So you slip, you always want to slip first with water or um, I use just water. So slip and then I'll score one side of the Pac-Man's mouth. And then what I'm going to be doing is overlapping the Pac-Man's teeth about a um, quarter of an inch. You always want to overlap about a good quarter of an inch or so. So what I'm doing right now is just joining the Pac-Man together so it can fit in that pookie. Otherwise, if you were able, if you just try to stick the circle right inside the pookie, it wouldn't fit. So I'm not even gonna worry about the inside. I'm just gonna go ahead and stick it in the pookie, like so. And I'm not gonna really press the pookie inside. I'm just gonna kind of get the overall shape going, like so. Okay, and I'm gonna take my finger and then just where I made that crease with the Pac-Man where I'm joining it, that's a weak spot in the pot. So you always wanna make sure you join those two surfaces really well together. And so now I'm going to, um, and what I'll do with the rest of the pie piece is I'll just cut a little circle or a square and I'll scratch and score. This is for the bottom of the pot. So in case I want to work the bottom more, I have a little bit of more room to work with. And the reason why you want to scratch and score or slip and score your clay is when you're putting the two clay bodies together, you're creating an air pocket. Um, so when you scratch and score, it's, it's allowing that air to disperse throughout the clay without trapping air pockets and air pockets are not good for clay. That's the downfall of clay. If you have air pockets in your clay, uh, forget it, you know. So I'll just lightly put that clay in the bottom just so I have extra room. And I always keep all my extra pieces of clay to the side because it's like gold and you don't want to waste your clay. You always want to keep your piles of clay to the side. So I'm going to start on my, my coil. So what I'll do, this has already been pre-wedged, you know, 100 to 200 times. I like to do at least 200 times of wedging. Now I was going to do a, a wedging um, demonstration, but I'll try to do that another time. Or if you have questions, you can get a hold of me on Facebook or um, email me. I'll, I'll send out that information also. So. So what I'm going to do is just roll out uh, a coil. It's a quite big coil. I like to use big coils, um, um, especially for this first part. It might be a little bit too big. But so as you're rolling your, your coils, what you want to do is kind of use your hands and push outwards. You just keep going like that and you keep working towards the out, towards the outside of each side of the coil. Jacob, for those who maybe don't know what wedging is, can you explain how the wedging process kind of takes out the air pockets? Okay, yeah. So I'll just set this side to a part. So the wedging process, um, so what you want to do is you get it pretty wet. So that's that's clay that I've already used. Um, it hasn't been wet. So any 
leftover clay, you always want to re-wedge again because you're trapping air pockets. So I'll get it to like a good consistency. And it's either called the ram horn or you can use um, a single hand wedging aspect. So what you're doing is just taking the palms of your hand and you're trying to push the clay together so it's all one um, form. It's, and uh, the problem with clay is that it traps a little tiny air pockets or big air pockets inside the clay. So the point of it is to stretch those air pockets out and you just kind of, you don't want to keep folding the clay because if you just fold the clay, you're just creating another air pocket. You want to try and keep the clay. Yeah, I kind of did that. So I'll just try to work this side. What it makes, it's kind of like when you're making fry bread, you know, you want to get that fry bread um, to the, the right consistency and texture so you can, you know, make your fry bread. It's the same with clay, you know, you've got to, you got to really spend time um, working the clay to get it to that con great consistency. And um, it just helps to, um, when I first started off pottery, I would say, ah, I don't need to wedge, I don't need to wedge. Um, and that's probably why most of my pots exploded growing up. Um, so it is a very important step in pottery building. It's just to make the clay one consistency and without any air bubbles, pretty much. If that answered your question. That's funny. I don't know. Thank you. I, yeah. <laughs> and I think something that's funny that people don't realize about wedging is how much muscle it takes. It's like it does. really difficult. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Now you can it's, get back. It's like all the, the, the ladies that make oven bread. You see their forearms. They're huge. They're built. They're even stronger than I am. <laughs> all right, go. So uh, I'm going to come back to the coil. Um, so I'm just rolling out the coil. This is actually a quite larger coil than I'm used to, but we'll work with it. So what I'll do is I'll just grab my coil and I'll kind of just measure it and say, okay, that's long enough. And I'll just take the palm of my hand with the coil and just lightly tamp it down. And then I'll just take my small rolling pin very lightly. This helps. I mean, you don't really have to do this, but I like to do it because it shows where the air bubbles are. I just lightly roll my rolling pin on top of the coil. And this will disperse the air bubbles that are in it. I can see that there's one air bubble right here. So I'll just take my knife and kind of just make macaroni out of it, I guess. Um, so there's one right there too. So there, I got my coil belt. Now I'm going to start applying it to my pookie inside. And I'm going to slip, slip the, slip the coil and I'm gonna slip the inside of the pot also, okay? Now I'm going to score, and I'm not going all the way through to the other side. I'm just scoring maybe a quarter of the way through. Um, and now I'm gonna score the inside of the cookie like so. I'm just going to make little tally marks about a quarter to a half inch along the rim. Okay. Like so. Now I'm going to take my coil. Um, I usually like to work left to right. I always grab with my left hand and lead with my right hand. Um, you might find another way that works best, but I'll pick it up with my left hand and grab it like this. Grab it like this. Oh, hold on. All right. Grab it like this. And like I said, it's quite big coil. And I'm just going to overlap it about quarter inch 
or even more. And that one just broke just perfectly. And where the two coils meet around the circumference of the pookie, you want to scratch and score there too. So right where the coils meet right here, you want to scratch and score. I right, scored first, so you want to slip and then score. There you go. And I'm always learning. I'm always a student of art. I'm still a beginner, so you know you never you're never a master until you're a master, I guess they say. So like I said, I didn't push the pookie all the way down inside or the clay. Now I'm going to take my three inch metal scraper and then just work the outside like so. Not too much and very systematically. I'm not gonna be working in one area. You just kind of want to do it all the way around the potteries or the base. And actually, I forgot to tell you guys. So the three key things or the six key things you always want to remember in a pottery. I guess you can't really see that though, but um, are so I got a little water here. So you have the base or the foot of the pottery, you have the body. You have the shoulder, you have the lip or the rim, and then you have the mouth and the neck. So the neck's between the shoulder and the lip or the rim. So those are the all the key elements or the, the anatomy of a pottery. So if you have those concepts in your head when you start off, it's a lot easier to say, okay, when am I going to create the shoulder? Or um, you know, when is when is it time to start the neck type idea. So it's always very important to keep that in the back of your head. I forgot to tell you that, but that was a tangent. So anyways, back to the pottery. I'm just going to go through and just slip or just join those coils together. Okay, like so. Now I'm going to take my two inch rubber scraper, which, which works perfectly. And I'm going to set the pot, the pottery or the, the base halfway in between the pookie and, um, and the, the curvature of the pottery. Cause you want to try to make the curve. And also the first coil is really important using the pookie process. Cause you want to really push those um, coils together. I'm just going to do that real quick. And so you get the gist of it, but I'll try to move on to the next step. So all I'm doing is just using the pookie and my scraper to push, push the clay together. Jacob, we have a question from somebody while we're talking about coil. Um, how many okay. coils it takes to complete a pot for you? Um, it just depends. Um, usually I like to work like on about five potteries at a time. Um, so I'm always constantly moving back, but on average from start to finish, I mean, if I have all the clay made, um, it takes me about a week or so, about a week of I mean, good, um, positive vibes and just uh, determination, discipline, um, and uh, just, yeah, you just have to really be positive and um, have discipline because you might say, oh, hey, I want to go watch Nanny Day Fiance, but I sh really should be standing at pottery. So stuff like that is um, important with pottery. It's not something that you can just pick up and say, hey, I'm going to make a pottery today. Um, you really have to be persistent about it and keep on the ball. Um, uh, it's really it takes a lot of work. So if you're if you're on the ball, it only takes you if you can whip them out real quick um, because it just becomes like driving or reading a book. It's just it really becomes natural. So that takes me about uh, the bigger potteries, for example, um, like a big Ola pot like this. This might take me about 
about two weeks or so, just because it takes so many more coils and the setting up process. So, how many coils would a pot that big have? Um, I would say, let's see, about one, two, three, five, about nine or 10 coils, big, uh, you know, pretty large coils. I do use smaller coils on some techniques of pottery that I use, but um, I usually use about 10 coils on something like that. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I'm moving on. I showed you that. So as you can tell, I press the potteries together. Kind of looks funny, but um, we'll make it work. But I'm going to move on now. So that's just the first, and I'll keep working that coil till it gets thinner. I'll keep just working it like this up very systematically going around the pot. I'm not working in one spot too much. And you gotta always be careful if you do use plaster not to get it in your clay because plaster is not good in your clay. It'll explode. And so just fair warning, do not get plaster in your clay. So I'm moving on. I got that one done. I already have some potteries built. So this is what happens after you're doing the first coil. So I've gotten the pottery, I've gotten the base or the foot, the body, and now I'm creating the shoulder. So what I'll do now is, this is a different style of clay now that I'm using. Um, it's more of a, a commercial style clay. So, oh. Okay, so I already got the coils rolled out to save some time. And I'm just going to smush it with my hand. Take my little rolling pin and just lightly roll it on top. Okay. I'm going to slip and score. Like so. And now I'm going to take this pottery. So this is the shoulder part. Now I just got to create the neck part. Okay. And I'm going to slip the inside of where I'm going to join my coil, slip and score. Like so, because you always want to make sure that those coils are joining together. If there's any kind of error, it's going to, going to have discrepancies and it's going to be most likely not make it but you always gotta be positive with pottery. Your attitude is the most important tool you can have. Um, you always wanna be positive and you always wanna be humble. So I'm just going to cut the coil and I'm gonna put it on the inside like so. I'm going to Slip and score where the two coils join the circumference of the pot. Okay. I'm going to push those together. And I'm just going to use my fingers to press together the clay, like so. And I'm just gonna use a scraper. I'm just gonna go like this, very, not too much, just enough to join them right now, because I still gotta work on the inside. The inside of your pot's very important because um, it's like humans or like anybody, you know, you may be 
look nice, might have nice clothes on the outside, but you may not be the most fun person on the inside. So it's like with pottery, always want to make sure the inside is just as well built as the outside. So I'm just going to take my finger now and smooth the coil on the inside like so. Oh, no, I got to cancel this. Okay. So I'm just using my finger like this. I got to keep working the outside of the potteries. So it looks like I got a crack started. Once you get a crack, you might want to start over. Actually, you will, you should start over if you get a crack. So yeah, and I'll just keep working the pottery up. And then I'll use the curve of my scraper. As you can see, it has a flat side and it has a rounded side. So what I'll use is this curved side like this, and I'll put it on the shoulder of my pottery and I'll create that shape with just my scraper. And I'll just go around the pot but, but this is after I've already worked the pot up. But I'm just getting ahead of myself. Um, so you just kind of want to use the curvature of that scraper. And if you're doing a flat style pot, you use the flat side. And I'm just using my hand as a brace as I'm pressing against the clay to get that shape going. Okay, but as you guys can see, and you always want to pay attention to your rim, keep it wet. Um, but I'm going to move on. I could spend more like an hour doing this. So I'm just going to move on to the next process, which is not the Puki style. This is uh, Diego Romero showed me this when he was an artist and resident at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I've adopted it. So, so this is just like the opposite of a pookie. It's the off, the upside down part of a pookie, I guess, or the the inner part, but it's opposite. So, it's the same idea. You're just creating the base or the foot um, to get your pot through going. What I'm going to do, I've already marked my my diameter this is how I do my foot I've already marked the bottom of where I'm going to put my foot okay and I've rolled out the little coil and I'm going to really make sure that I slip and score you actually want to have some extra mud or slip not just water to use on this process so you just want to slip it and then scratch like so. And then you want to slip your coil where you're going to join it to the next piece of clay like so. And I'm just going to put this coil, uh oh, it broke. Might have hung out long, too much this morning. I kind of hung out. It's a little dried out on me, but I was trying to get stuff ready, but we'll make it work. So we'll go like this. We'll just add that coil like that, kind of like, kind of like um, a woven piece of basket to carry a pottery on your head. It's kind of like the same idea. So what I did is I just did like that, and I'm going to smooth the one end of the coil for the foot. So this is the bottom. This is pretty new to me too. I've only been doing this about a year now or a year and two years now. So I'm still very um, uh, new to it. And I'm, you know, 
I find myself um, just learning every day, every every time I pick it up. Um, you're always always a student of art, and you always got to just you know keep learning. The more you learn, better off you will, because it's all it's just like a river. I mean, it all flows in one direction. Not one direction; it can flow both directions, but. It's all a cycle. It's all just a creation of um, of Mother Earth and everything. Here I go on a tangent. I've been listening to too much Kishi and Powell. Just kidding. So yeah. So I'm just creating that foot, and you really want to make sure that it sticks good because if there's any air bubbles, and what I'll do is I'll just take the bottom. I kind of just lightly press it down, okay? Create that base. And I'll just take my circle like so. It's a little bit faster than what I usually do. I was just trying to show you all. So after you get that process done, you want to let it sit probably about, um, you don't want to let it sit overnight because the clay will start shrinking and it will it'll start cracking, of course, because clay shrinks. But, um, you want to make sure that you pay attention of it so you can pull it off of off the, uh, the mold before it cracks. So this one I did last night and I kept it covered. So as you can tell, it has the foot and it's just the base of a pottery. So like so. So this is the other method without a pookie. So this is more of a freestanding style. And I'm going to slip the inside because this is a little bit, I usually like to add some, uh, like a piece of cloth or some tissue or like paper towel around the edge of where I'm going to be joining the, the, uh, the coil. But I think it's okay for now. But if it does dry on you, you can always use that method. Just wet your rim of where you're going to join your next coil. So I'm going to scratch, or I slipped. I'm going to scratch now. Like so, okay. I'm going to get my next coil, which is already rolled out. And you don't want any kind of chunks or anything on your table as you're making. You always want to keep your area clean, which I struggle with. Um, you always want to be as clean as you can. It helps. So I rolled out the coil. I'm just going to use the palm of my hand again to go like that. I'm just going to lightly, with my baby rolling pin, again, just lightly go along the top, okay, just to see if there's any air bubbles. And there's no air bubbles, so A plus. It's always a good feeling when you don't have air bubbles in your clay. So I'm going to slip the coil again, okay? Yeah. So slip, now I'm gonna score, all right? This coil is a little bit long, should have measured it, but so I'm going to pick it up with my right hand and lead with and lead with my right also. So I'm just going to go along the base about a quarter of an inch, okay? No. Okay. I'm going to cut the axis where the two coils join 
around the circumference of the base or the, the body of the, or the, the foot and the base of the pot. And I'm going to scratch and score that area also because anytime you're joining two surfaces, you always want to scratch and score. It doesn't matter. You can say, oh, I don't need to join it this time, but I guarantee it will catch up with you in the long run. So I'm just going to go around and smush those coils together like so. Okay. Now I'm going to take my three inch, two and a half inch metal scraper, and I'm going to use the shape of my hand and the scraper as I'm working to, to hold this and, and shape and pull the clay. You really want to stretch your clay as much as you can. The more you stretch your clay, the less chance of it um, having an air bubble. You want it as thin as you can get it, but not too thin. So it's a flying lark. And it's just systematically, like I said, this clay might have, but it's working. Uh, systematically, just go around. Uh-oh, almost time, but. I wanted to do a pinch pot demonstration also, so I'm gonna try and get there. But like I said, just systematically go around the outside. You don't wanna focus and be working in one area too long because that's where you start getting out of proportion. So yeah, and I'll just keep continue building up coil, uh, slip, uh, making sure the inside's good. I'll add another coil, but I usually only add about two coils uh, to three coils at a time. Um, you kind of want to let your clay set, uh, set up. You don't want to overwork or underwork your clay. It's a fine line. You always got to remember, you say, okay, I've worked enough. Um, and you always got to remember not to overwork your clay because um, you got to know when to quit is the thing. You got to say, okay, you know, work on something else, move on to something else. Um, that's why it's best to work with multiple pots, not just one, because uh, you get tunnel vision and you just start going away and you want to work on multiple things so you can go along, yeah. So I'm just going to go like that and I'm going to take the inside of my finger again and scrape the inside. But I've already showed you that process, so I'm going to go to the next pottery. So I'll show you um, what it looks like after I, you know, smoothed the coil and got the shoulder going. Okay. So moving on. Jacob, we can go and, see. and just have a little bit fewer time for questions. So no rush. Okay. Okay. Just go to 11 and then. Yeah, we have some some more questions in the chat, but not um, too many. So take as much okay. time as you need. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. I hope I'm not moving too fast or anything. But, um, I don't think so. I think you're a born teacher. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Lilia. So, uh, so anyways, so this is the foot pottery. Okay, so this is what it will look like. Um, after I've you know added the first coil and I've created the shoulder, so I've got the foot or the base, the body going, and then this is the beginning of the shoulder. So um, this is how I work. I always like to create my shoulder, and um, you can either leave it open for like a seed pot or a bowl or. Um, you know, but in this instance, I'm going to add another coil. And this is a different, this is the siltstone style clay. Um, is a, I call it the Rayma clay. Um, it's good for molding and figurative work, but uh, some things it's not good for like doing the upside down pookie because it, it really tends to crack and it's like a B, B, B minus clay. Um, so, 
but it's good because it's there's it's abundant source and it's right on the side of the road. So, um, and you always want to make sure you keep your tools clean. So what I do is I just scrape. I'll just take the excess clay and make sure you always keep your pieces. And then just scrape off your tools. You always want to keep your tools, work area, stuff like that clean. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do is slip the inside again. I'm going to score. Okay. And then it looks like it's a little bit oscilla or sideways, as you can tell, it kind of looks like it on one side. It's all due to my base. My base wasn't straight. So you can see it has a little bit of a tilt, but it's going to be an organic pot. So I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. So once again, adding another coil, I got my coil ruled out um, to consistency and thickness. I like it. I'm going to take the palm of my hand again. And go like that. Baby rolling pin. <clears throat> and lightly go on top of it again. I mean, you can you can really use the rolling pin more, but I've learned to keep my coil thick instead of trying to make them thin. Because it's better to have more room to work with than less room to work with, if that makes sense. Um, you always want to keep a uh, room. Um, you never want to cut yourself short. You always want to have more room to work with. And see, I'm making a mistake right now. You always want to slip because if, if I scored first and then I slipped, I'm just covering up my score marks and it doesn't make no sense. So you always want to slip and then score. Okay. And just about a quarter of an inch along the edge. And I always do it on the, the side that's away from me. It works best. I'm going to pick it up with my left and lead with my right. Okay. So I'm just overlapping it about a quarter of an inch again. And I only make my coils as big as my fingers because if they're big and I have little baby fingers, we have big long fingers more power to you, but I have little baby geo puff fingers. Um, but it's good for making pottery. Some things like playing guitar, no, not so much. But I still play guitar. So. Anyway, so I'm just adding the coil and I'm going to, once again, when the coils meet around the circumference of the pot, like that, I'm going to scratch and scratch that part where I'm going to put the coils together because they're coming together. And you have to always scratch and score. So here we go. I'm just going to use my fingers again, like so. OK. All right. And you can tell the pot is a little bit leaning, but I'll be able to fix that during the um, sanding process. Um, it's kind of hard to go back now. You really always want to make sure your pot's centered right off the bat, because um, it's just like a foundation to a house. If your house is you know, leaning to one side, it's going to lean to one side and you're going to see it. So same aspect of building a pottery. It's just just step by step um, building a house. You know, you, you want to start off square, not, not unsquare, or however you want to go about it. But like I said, so I just already added that coil. I'm just going to go around systematically using the curvature of my fingers and the scraper against the clay. Like so.
And I'll just keep stretching the clay, stretching the clay, working the clay on the inside. Um, and then, like I said, I'll either use the shape of my, my pottery tool to create the neck as it goes up, um, or I'll just um, use my hands. I use, I use a lot of my hands. I don't um, use scrapers. I use scrapers, but a lot of the times, for example, I'm gonna move on to the next demo. Um, I'll be, be I'll still be working on these clays when you guys are probably not watching, but I'm not abandoning them, to, so to say. So I'd like to do a real quick uh, pinch pot demonstration. Um, so pinch pots are really fun. You can spend a lot of time on them and just really just have a good time making pinch pots. If you can make a pinch pot, it really um, gets the, the juices flowing inside your brain, how to make a big pot. If you can't make a pinch pot, it's really kind of hard to make a big pot. Um, it's best to start off small and then keep graduating and keep um, building your confidence up. Um, so, and when you're working with clay, you always want to, you know, have a conversation, say, you know, hey, how are you going? Um, you know, you know, just have a conversation with Mother Earth, you know, because she determines how it's going to come out. You're just kind of along for the ride. You're just staring. She's on the gas pedal and the brakes. So, so anyway, so, so this is just a, a pookie style pot and a little pookie. I've got my shoulder started. And now I'm going to work on my um, my rim or my neck. So instead of adding a coil this time, I'm just going to use my fingers to pull up the clay and create that shoulder or that neck and the lip. Okay. So this is without adding a coil to make your neck. And it's it's good if you want like an open neck ola or um, a vase. Um, it's just, there's different styles and this is a style that it's just another way of, there's so many ways and you know, it's not open up to one way, no way is the right way. Um, but so yeah, I'm just using my hands and pulling that rim up. Like so, okay. And I'll just keep going along and you can kind of see that it's starting to shape itself. All right, and that's just a baby pinch or a bigger pinch pot. So I'm gonna do a real quick um, pinch pot demo real quick, okay? It's 10.55. Jacob, while you're doing this, can I throw some questions at you? Oh, of course, yeah, sure. Right. Um, so we have one question from I think probably our youngest viewer, Elizabeth, um, who is age eight, and she's wow. asking you um, if you put stories in the clay. I do put stories in the clay. Uh, it's it's a it's a conversation. Um, even when I gather my clay, it's always a story. That's a huge part of my process, um, and I always like to think. Um, you know, where I got the clay and it's kind of like a rhythm or a, or a song um, that goes into my clay. It, it's a conversation that only me and me and the clay have. I mean, it's kind of hard to really explain it, but um, once you have it, you'll, you'll know that you're, you're having a story. So thank you. Right. Yeah, I really wanted to make sure we got to that question. Um, so thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I answered it very well, but. No, you did. You did. Um, and we also have a question about what is your favorite type of clay to work with? Um, so my favorite type of clay, I use like a hybrid. I use a mixture of clays. I use micaceous clay from Picaris. I add that into pretty much all my clay. I use a mixture of Zuni clays that I find in and around uh, Zuni. I live in Zuni with my wife and dog here. Um, I use 
So my favorite clay I would have to say is definitely Zimi clay because it's very, very strong and um, um, is one of the most nicest clays in the wide world. Uh, it's very kaolin and there's very little access, less access when it comes to it. I mean, when you put it in a bucket, it's just pure clay. So, and when I get my clay, I use, I haul it down my backpack or ride my bike. So it's a sacrifice, literally. Um, I'm not just getting as much as I can and having all this waste. It's a, it's really a, you know, it's a process of uh, having that clay. So. Zumi clay is my favorite for sure. And I'm lucky that it's only about eight miles away from here so. Fantastic. Um, so you can keep going and then we have some more questions um, okay. if we get to them, but if we don't, I think we can have you back. Awesome. All right, <laughs> awesome, Lilia. Okay, so I'm gonna just start with a, a pinch pot demonstration, okay guys? So I'm just, like you can see how it's just rolling a ball in my hand and this is for, you know, beginners, um, you just, Roll a ball, you can roll out multiple balls. That's what I like to do. I like to roll about five. It's good to work in stages. It's good not to just have one, you know, one particular um, piece of artwork that you're working on because it gets just redundant and it's good to have, it's good to have a balance. I mean, balance and variety. Uh, it's just it's just really important, especially with pottery and all art forms. Um, my dad always taught me guys to work on multiples. So I got three balls rolled up, just kind of like little meat balls, or yeah, meat balls, big meat balls. Um, and I'll take my finger, my pointing finger, and I'll just stick it inside that ball of clay, like so. Okay. And I'll just twist it. I'm actually gonna come up to the camera for this. Okay, so I just stuck it in there like that, okay? Now I'm going to use this pinching motion with my fingers like this, between my pointing finger and my thumb. Kind of like you're playing the world's smallest violin. It's the idea. Um, so you just keep going like this and you just use that pinching motion and you wanna just start off with your foot, just like a big pop. So you always wanna start off with the base, okay? And then you just keep going up and you always wanna keep, you don't wanna start working on the rim. Let's see, you don't wanna start working on this rim part right off the bat. You want to work on the base, just like a normal pot. So I'm just working on working on the base, okay? And then I'll take it and I just kind of make it flat, okay? And now I'll take, so I have this clay along the rim that I'm leaving over and I will, I don't know if you can see it, but I will just Kind of leave, a leave an overhang between my pinching motion. So I'm kind of pushing, I'm pushing the clay out, okay? Kind of hard to do this and watch the camera, but. So, yeah, you're just doing that. And then, and you can you can spend hours and hours on pinch pots. Um, you can really get into pinch pots. I like pinch pots because um, they're just so cute. And when I was a kid growing up, I just loved pinch pots. Is all I used to make. So, and it's just it's really um, kind of like taking just a piece of clay and making something out of it. So I'll work on, I'll work on multiple ones. Going, but uh, yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Jane. Hey, no problem.
that was really fantastic. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to share so much about your work with us. Um, learning about the Pac-Man technique at the beginning and then ending with pinch, pinch pots, it was just brilliant. So thank you. Um, hey, thank you. We do have some other questions. Um, I know most people will have to run, um, but there is one question that I think a lot of people would be interested in. Um, talk okay. about if you feel okay staying for another few minutes. Oh, I'm fine. I could stay, stay here all day. I, I probably, I stay here all day anyway. So this is my natural environment. <laughs> cool. Uh, it doesn't really bother me. I could take pot pottery all day. Sounds great. Um, all right. So Rob is asking if you can talk about the sh some of the pots that are behind you on the shelf. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let me clean my hands. Um, this pottery right here is one of my most recent potteries. Um, it was a series I did, and it's, um, oops. So this is more of a, uh, so I'm trying to uh, revive the before, before, um, revive the Tsuki style um, polychromes before the 1880s. So before rain gods or uh, bunny makers as we call them. Um, styles of pottery. So um, I'm trying to revive the styles of uh, pottery paint um, and design work that they use. So a lot of these designs came from the School of American Research, MIAC, for example. This design came from MIAC, but I just changed it into my own way. Uh, I'm really kind of against copying the exact design. I always like to change it. So oh, it's just the four seasons of, of earth or of the, the year. So you have planting, you know, spring, you have summer, you have winter, and you have fall. So it's just a continuous cycle. And each design is particularly different. Um, and this one's outdoor fired, and you can hear the differences between the firing tone. You can hear this kind of like a dud. It's a low fire. It's only been low, uh, fired at probably, you know, 1200 or 1100 degrees. Um, and it's just a real, um, it's probably 017, which is probably the temperature that it's fired at. Um, these are some of the more other potteries that I've collected. Well, these aren't my potteries, but I use them as references. Because I love pottery, I'm always holding on to pottery. Um, but this one's a Tatsuki design, design also. And this one's electric kiln fire, but you can hear the difference. Hear that ring? It's like an 04. So um, if your pottery has any kind of crack or discrepancy in it, it always has to have that ring. Um, so that's a Tatsuki design. This is more of a uh, prehistoric design. So this is a Chaco design. Uh, it's another pottery collection of mine. It's not mine particularly. I just love pottery and I keep them around because the presence and you can hear the ring also. And it's a Chaco design from uh, probably about 1170, 1150, I believe it was. Um, it was found in uh, Casablanca. Uh, so. A lot of my inspiration comes from prehistoric designs, um, finding pottery shards and learning from my ancestors. Um, I wasn't really definitely taught. This is the way I've kind of learned my own way. And um, it's really exciting. And so, and I work with contemporary style pots too. Like this one was for my senior project. So this one's done more with, um, commercial techniques. So it's um, glazed, uh, it's fired, glazed, and then I painted it with acrylic. And usually I don't really like acrylic because it's tacky, but it's just my own opinion. I mean, uh, uh, but as you can tell, I try to seal it. I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to flake off, but it's kind of like a family heirloom. I just, we keep it in our house to put stuff in it. It's just a big storage pot, I guess. I, I tried to keep some of my pottery because um, when you can modify it, um, 
you are you're always constantly making and um, giving them away or you know uh, uh, giving to somebody and you're like oh I really wish I would have kept that pot so it's good to keep pottery for yourself um, you never want to uh, sell sell yourself out so to say so, yeah thank you so much for sharing those it's always so great to hear how um, museum collections can inspire um, contemporary artists like yourself. Um, so yes, that, yes. Yeah. Um, I did the, the journey home with uh, Jonathan Laredo and I went to stars and I was just in paradise. So, and even Mayak, I mean, I love Mayak's pottery collection. I spent hours there, so. Fantastic. Um, so I think a good place to end it is a question from Taryn who is asking if you have any future events or happenings coming up that we should all know about. Um, okay, so I really am, this is, I'm really coming out from underneath my um, cave. I've been kind of um, with the circumstances of COVID and stuff like that. I've, um, you know, I haven't stopped making pottery, but um, I'm trying to Definitely, this was my first step of okay. Let's let's go, Jake. Quit quit slacking. Um, I really don't have anything planned. I'm kind of just taking things as they come. Um, but I definitely gotta uh, put my nose to say to the grinding wheel and uh, feel uncomfortable. I mean, if you're not feeling uncomfortable, like I said, this is my third Zoom meeting, and so I've never done this type of thing. But uh, it's just gotta keep. Keep, keep on keeping on, you know, and um, I really don't know if I have any, um, I'm sure I will, um, but um, just got, it's all about networking and putting yourself out there. If you don't do that, um, you can say, well, you can only blame one person and that's yourself. So um, at the moment, I have no things, but maybe on Facebook, you'll see some of my artwork, but I'm trying to get in touch with um, galleries, but I'm, for my own experience, I just don't think I'm ready for galleries, and um, I'm just I'm just enjoying the pottery process right now and learning, um, learning, and just trying to get to a good point where I think I'm um, there. So, yeah. Well, we'll get you on. What's that? We'll get you on our calendar again. <laughs> cool. Awesome. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for this, and uh, it's it's awesome. It's really a great learning experience. Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we have yes, thank you. And um, thank you, Jacob, for taking the time to share so much of your expertise with us. It was really- Hey, you guys are so welcome. I'm sorry if I was a little bit, um, you know, I'm not too uh, uh, clear on some things, but uh, it's really hard to do it on the computer. I rather have that interaction, but um, if you ever need some more pointers, don't hesitate in contacting me. I'm here. I love to teach. I love to help out other potters. Um, I have, you know, I have secrets, but I'll, I'll tell them to you. <laughs> um, so we, we're all we're all potters and we're all here. So um, don't forget to wear your mask. Uh, don't forget to wash your hands and social distance and protect your elders. Um, so that's important. Perfect. All right. Well, we're going to sign off now and thank you. Cool. All right. See y'all later.